I have been warned that if I don't finish early, I will become lunch. <laughs> but first of all, let me thank IPPAI for this opportunity. Harry has finally allowed me into these hallowed halls. Uh, my, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. What I want to discuss with you in the next 15 minutes or so is one part which we have just alluded to, but it is at the center of what we do. All of us are in this room because you and I and everybody else in India wants electricity. If they didn't want electricity, there was no need for us, there was no need for the power stations. There's no need for transmission lines or distribution lines. What do those people want? And this nobody else, it's us. What I'd like to do is to focus on how our behavior, our collective behavior, for the demand for electricity is, I hope to make the case to you, changing. And consequently, we need to look at an additional set of regulations. This is not to say that tariffs for distribution companies need to be addressed. This is not to say that loss reduction in transmission and particularly in distribution needs to be addressed. Of course it does. I would suggest that looking at the distribution part of the picture is as important as looking at the supply side. Now, as we look ahead, we know very well that the capacities have increased. I think the latest numbers which people have been saying here is something like 300 gigawatts. Okay, that's wonderful. However, at the same time, I'm also hearing people saying that the PLF has dropped. So on the one hand, the installed capacity has gone up, and on the second, the PLF has gone down. I think it behooves us to understand why this PLF is declining. I'm often told this is because there isn't enough demand. Well, just look at the peaks for the last three years. 131,000 megawatts, 146,000 megawatts, and on the 9th of September this year, about 156,000 megawatts. The peaks have been increasing. It's not as if they're not. And these are substantial increases. Clearly much less than the 300,000 megawatts we have, but demand is increasing. Yet the PLF is decreasing. Why? You know, the place Mr. Sony has made Posoko a great place. He has made data available. He has made graphs available. You can pull them out they tell a great story. What they tell us is that while the maximum demand has increased and the minimum demand has increased, the difference between them is also increasing. And obviously, PLFs fall. Why is this happening? Also, let's look at on the macro picture at what is happening as far as sales of electricity is concerned. We note that buildings are, in lead, are now approaching industry in how much electricity that they use. And this is not because of the newly electrified homes. The newly electrified homes use very little electricity, yet, there is a large increase in the amount of electricity used by commercial and residential buildings together. What we have seen over the past few years is that you now see a very strange load curve, you know, at this time of the year, in the last two months. And the very strange load curve is you have a peak relatively late in the day. You have a peak in the mid-afternoon, and you have a peak late in the day. Why is this there? The afternoon peak is office air conditioning. And the evening peak is when office, home, and shop air conditioners are all working. This tells us 
that a new source of demand is now taking hold whose usage pattern is, 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 is influencing the demand pattern across the entire electricity system. What this has meant also is, you know, you saw in the previous slide, in the day itself, what was the maximum and the minimum. Last year, uh, the maximum we used, which was, I think, on the 1st of September, if I'm not wrong, was 146,000 megawatts. In November, it was less than 120,000 megawatts. And obviously, on the year to year, you saw the peak going from 131 to 145 to 156. Whether it is on a daily scale, or on a seasonal scale, or on an yearly scale, what we are seeing is the variability of demand is increasing. And I would suggest that one of the largest components of it, to the extent that I've done the numbers, it seems almost half of it, is because of the air conditioning demand. Air conditioning is not used by poor people. It is used by people like us. It enhances our productivity. It is important, but it has a cost. And I, what I am going to suggest is that we need to look at this as we look to managing the supply in the future. On the other hand, what is also happening and has been discussed in great detail is the fact that the variability in supply is increasing as well. Look at the variability in supply in Gujarat for wind and for uh, solar. And you combine the two and it takes us to relatively large variations. This part, I think most people already understand. What also happens, and this is, I have to thank Mr. Sony again for the second slide that you see on the right side of the screen. What happens if 20,000 megawatts of solar comes into the grid? From the red curve, we will go to the blue curve as far as thermal power need is concerned. So just see in the same day, the demand between the maximum and the minimum for thermal power will become even larger. Short point, as we go ahead, both on the demand side and the supply side, we will see increases in volatility of demand and of supply. Clearly, this means that costs will increase. Clearly, this means that we will need to address, on the one hand, how do we address the volatility in uh, demand, and people should pay for the volatility that they are inducing in the system, and on the other hand, manage the volatility in the supply that is being injected into the grid, the more and more independent my suggestion is that we need to look at five things. We need to have enough electricity. Nobody will disagree with this. What has happened is that we need now the capacity for very quick turn up times. And interestingly enough, for turn down times. We are now seeing almost on a regular basis in summer, peaks which increase at 200 megawatts a minute. Last year at Diwali, the demand increased at 600 megawatts a minute. The CRC has required the new supercritical power stations to have turn up capacity, I think which is 3% a minute of their, uh, uh, of their uh, design plate capacity. So if it's a 600 megawatt system, 3% of that is 18. So 18 megawatts a minute is what is being prescribed for new supercritical plants that come in. We will need to add to the system things that can come up fast. Now, the problem that intermittent supply does is that there is a, for example, a blast of wind. And then it disappears. Well, you have to go up and come down. Similarly, there's a cloud that passes. Suddenly there is a demand for electricity and then it comes down. So even the peaks are becoming shorter than that they were. 
We obviously need to enhance uh, the amount of renewables in the grid. That becomes important from a huge number of uh, points of view, whether it is managing our uh, 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 supplies of uh, fuels, whether it is urban and uh, national air pollution. We see the new uh, environmental standards that, have, that the thermal power stations have to put in place. It is important from the point of view of local supply. It's also important in view of the commitments that we have made in the climate change negotiations. Now, while doing all of this, I believe we also have to minimize costs. All of this means that we have to enhance flexibility into the system. What does flexibility mean? I would suggest, as I said, the ability for faster turn up, availability of gas in gas based generators, whatever gas we have, and whatever is the increased amount of gas we get, should be used to match when intermittent power supply comes down. That's the best use of the system now. A paradigm change from the traditional points of view that you used gas for peaking and coal for base loads. My suggestion is every distribution company needs to do the mathematics of what does this mean as far as their own costs are concerned. Clearly, storage is important. Because when renewables are generating, when there is a lower demand, you need to store it somewhere. Today we are talking of pump to storage. There was a 10,000 megawatt program of pump to storage announced recently. And in the longer term, we would need to look at batteries. The one thing that I'd like to focus on is we need much more demand response management. What is respond, demand response management? When you are hitting a peak, you send out a message to an adequate number of consumers who either they or the distribution company itself through remote control reduces their demand. For example, takes their ACs from a temperature setting of wherever it is, 19, 20, 21, 22, and puts it at 26. You immediately get a large amount. The, the North Delhi Power Distribution Company, the Tata Power Distribution Company, carried out a pilot, which was largely an industry, and found that without any incentive, they could get over a 200 megawatt load, a demand response reduction of seven megawatts on an almost instantaneous basis, 10 minutes or so. It is doable. If you provide financial incentives, Probably it will drive people faster. It will mean, however, that much of equipment that we use will need to be engineered so that remote control can be done. We will need to make sure that the distribution, uh, um, uh, the electricity distribution lines are such that different loads are on different circuits so that certain circuits can be s switched off if they are not of great importance. This brings me to the last slide. So what do we need as far as regulations is concerned? I will argue, and many of you have heard me say this ad nauseum, we need time of day peak, uh, tariffs. I've also, in, you know, it's been told to me that people don't like increases in tariffs. May I suggest that we therefore look at tariffs which are set at the peak, and for use in non-peak times, you provide a discount. Behavioral, consumer behavior research tells us that that is accepted far more than peaks. The second I would suggest is buildings, particularly commercial buildings where the vast amount of new air conditioning is bringing, is being coming in, provide a surcharge for inefficient buildings. Inefficient buildings being defined as what is the floor area of the building, how much kilowatt hours they used last year, divide one by the other. If that number 
kilowatt hours per square meter per year is below or is say above a certain number, say 200, there is a penalty on, there's a surcharge on those. We need to tell people who are using air conditioners that there's a cost they're imposing on the system. It's good for them, their electricity bills reduce, it's good for the system if the demand becomes less volatile. We obviously need ancillary services to bring in balancing power. You know, when we talk of convergence between renewable energy and, say, thermal energy, what is important is not just the cost of renewable power, but the cost of renewable power plus, plus the cost of balancing power, both of them together. That is where we need to make it competitive with coal if renewables have to come into the grid in a large way. And finally, we need regulations that enable demand response management. As a first step, start requiring air conditioners to build in a chip that they can be remote controlled. Whether the remote control is done by the facility manager inside the building or by the distribution company can be decided later. But at least let's ensure that the new capacity that comes in has this capability. Then you as regulators could look at tariffs for those people who agree to participate in DRM programs. Believe you me, across the world, DRM costs approximately one third of what it would cost to buy that little peak. I think it was uh, North Delhi uh, uh, CEO who told me that the top 2% of the power, peak power that he uses, he uses for less than 40 hours a year. That is the ideal target for demand response management. I'd like to leave you with the thought that looking at patterns, the changing patterns of demand is worth it. Load curve research is essential. That as we move into the future, yes, the addition of renewables is important, needs to be addressed, so does the change in the demand patterns. Thank you very much. Shall we take a few questions? Yeah, okay. Questions. Absolutely. Any questions? Yes. Sing up. Hydro ratio supposed to be up in up for our Indian conditions should be around 40 percent has reduced drastically to 17 percent. If you see the total hydro generation of the country is something around 42,000 megawatt compared to the our uh, SS potential of something around 150,000 megawatt. I like to have your view, sir. So can we take three or four questions? It will just yeah, make my life easier. Sir, right at the end. This is Anup Singh from IIT Kanpur. Uh, just two quick thoughts. One was, like you mentioned, uh, time of day tariff is an important thing. Another uh, just a subset of that is curtailable tariff itself, which I think our regulators have not just started looking into. Uh, the other is, which is related to the air conditioner's um, efficiency, and this is a very simple suggestion. Uh, one I think we discussed also long back is um, we have a three star, four star, five eight star air conditioners, but if you look at the the delta, the cost increase between these three to four star or four to five star, is much more than what probably can be economically justified by the consumers or even can be technically justified by the producers. The idea is why shouldn't we have five star plain vanilla ACs available? No buzzwords around it, 
it doesn't work, it doesn't serve much of the purpose of the consumer. Our objective is to be able to meet our demand, why shouldn't we be imposing it? Uh, okay. The second, second yep. just very quick suggestion is that, uh, why shouldn't all these high energy guzzling appliances be fitted with a very small, it's possible to have a chip based small energy meter right there itself. Okay. Either the so ACs can do it or the 16 ampere or 15 ampere yep. plug points can do it, just build a small LED things. At least the consumer knows sure. how much I have consumed because I was I have put on the ACs. Yeah. I think the information is important here. We can work. Thank you. Any, any other question? Yeah. Third question. We'll the, last question. the last question. Yeah. Satyajit Ganguly, managing director with ONGC Tripura Power Corporation. Sir, you talked about generation control through governor. Uh, almost 35 percent of our thermal power generators are LMZ machines, where governor control is almost not there. So how to tackle that? And secondly, sir, you also talked about, apart from governor control, EGC. Yeah. I think it is automatic generation control. In India, we call it AGC. And it is not available uh, yeah. anywhere. So yeah. how to do yeah. that? Thank okay. you, sir. Uh, I'll take one more from Rakesh Nath Saab. Ajay, first, I must compliment you for the excellent presentation that you have given. Thank you, sir. And you have raised a very, very important question, uh, that, that is the demand projections. I think there is practically no demand research being carried out in the country. And that is creating a major problem for us, because states are not able to, even after the restructuring of the state, there is no single agency to plan the demand of the whole state. Uh, the uh, planning for the future demand of power in the states, planning for transmission, which is presently based on the long-term access, and now that the states are not going for the long-term TPS, that long-term access is also not taking place. So this is a major question which is coming. Who will do this planning, yeah. and can your organization contribute in this important task of uh, doing the research on demand and planning the future demand of the states? I'm working with West Bengal Energy Commission, so I think depending on time based criteria we should use. Yeah, so correct. And purely between the yeah. criteria. We have some uh, incentive base also for the agriculture also. We have extended their working hours up to in the morning. So that Farmers, I mean, who uh, are, I mean, uh, supposed to run the pumps in the night hours, they can run in the day hours also. Yeah, yeah, like this, we have, we are doing. But now coming back to the issue to be addressed. As rightly you have pointed out, there are two peaks. One is the day peak, which is likely to be given address in the near future through the solar. Yeah. Maybe some hicks up here and there because of cloud. But the evening peak, which is really is a big concern for all of us, which is not in a position to be addressed. Correct. Now, there are two things which we'll have to look into. As a Terry being on the leading research organization, you can come out with your suggestions and your research paper. All the commercial houses, first you can start with that. They should be properly insulated. Yes. We totally neglect this yes. subject, and in the process, my both heating load and cooling load is abnormally high. Correct. So you ensure that the, you th th conduct a thorough study in different type of buildings, how, I mean, the load demand changes per square meter square. area yeah. of here, yeah. and then accordingly, we make it a mandatory, if you want, the government should in make it a mandatory that all them have to be, energy efficiency should be a built-in. Sir. Second, all those who commercial building or large residential complex which are coming, they should have a facility for, I mean, storing ice by gener using the right. night power. Right. So that can be used during the rest of the day. Because in general, if you see that the advantage what you're giving through the time of the metering, it will be payback, maximum will be payback into three to four years time. So there will be not much of, I mean, uh, financial outflow from them, but it will certainly start balancing. Then coming to what has been told by him, please ensure 
there is no rating other than five star. <laughs> yes. It should yes. be, there will be some reason now, whether it is AC or fridge or fans or pumps, because why you are replacing them? First we are putting a three star, we are putting non-star, nothing, and then we are replacing it. And a BWE and those, they are coming with a model of replacement. Why? At least all features should be not there. So this way we should be in a position to really, and LED is certainly the big drive is going on. The LED should happen so that we really cut down the demand, which is unproductive and which can be controlled. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, very brief responses because I know that uh, lunch is waiting. Uh, uh, Sing sub hydro is clearly important, but what one of the track records of our country is that we are a very densely populated country and finding space for hydro has traditionally been a problem and that's why the R&R issues keep coming up again and again. Even in the four plants which are ready where pump storage can be done, the tail end reservoirs have not been made because of land issues. This is an issue that will need to be resolved. Nevertheless, hydro's importance cannot be minimized. This is something which has to be on priority. It is the cheapest option, whether it is for electricity generation or whether it is for storage generation. Anup gave a number of options that we have to look at how we move into the future. I think they should provide a degree of comfort to the regulators that there are these multiple regulations, multiple options available as we go ahead. But one of the points that both Anup and Dr. Sen brought out was the issue of why should we have not have only five-star air conditioners? Please allow me a minute. And at this point of time, I'm donning my old hat uh, from the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. The standards for air conditioners have been made more stringent every two years. So what was five-star became four-star, became three-star, and from next year will become two-star. In other words, the five-star year on year, or two years on two years, is far better than what it was earlier. Now, why do we have five stars? One, because people do have, so the first issue that I'd like to say that everything is between, which is between one star and five star is much more efficient than what it was yesterday. And tomorrow's one to five star will be more efficient than what it is today. But why a band? Each one of us has personal needs. Each one of us has a certain amount of money in our pockets. Each one of us makes a decision. Do I want to invest more today and pay it less tomorrow or the other way around? Also, it depends where you're using the air conditioner. If I'm using it in an office, clearly it should be five star. But in your conference room, possibly in the guest room of your house, it does not make sense to put a five star. You use it for such a small amount of the time that whether it is you or the grid, the impact is very small. For those, I would suggest a three star is good enough. Short point, I think we need a range. Everything can be revisited, but I'm just putting out the philosophy of why we have one to five. On the issue of governors and Thank you for the AGC uh, nomenclature. These can only be pushed by regulation. As uh, the need for uh, a sharp uh, um, uh, 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 increases turn-up ratios are needed, we, the regulators would need to ask uh, the thermal power stations uh, and the system to put in governors. I mean, this can only be regulatory driven. It will not happen in any other way. On the issue of load curves, which Mr. Rakesh Nath mentioned, I think every regulator and every distribution company needs to periodically, every three, four years, need to do lo load research. At the Bureau, we had funded every state, every distribution company to do load research. I think something like 60 have completed the first round of load research. As far as Terry is concerned, we have started a program of projecting demand. 
and projecting demand at the national level, at the state level, and ultimately at the distribution company level for the time up to 2030 based on four major uh, user sectors. What we want to do is to put this in the public domain together with our assumptions. People can play around with them. What we hope is that they become a kind of a template for anybody who wants to say, okay, the buildings are not going to increase at 8%, they'll increase at 4%. Okay, put it in, see what the difference is. But what we'd like to do is to make these uh, available to you. Sir, I completely agree that we need to also pilot the uh, things like the ice making. Uh, there were two pilots that the Bureau had uh, um, uh, support. We didn't provide financial support, but we provided a lot of other technical support and facilitative support for two that were being done in Bombay. Unfortunately, neither of them have been completed. But I think it behooves us to look at creating pilots for this technology and other technologies that could provide these options of moving the, uh, use from peak hours to non-peak hours. Again, my own feeling is that this should be a, not a R&D program, but a deployment program that needs to be promoted by the government. Thank you very much.